Okay. Great. Well, I'm very happy once again to have this opportunity through our uh, school technology to uh, visit with you in your school and to have this uh, fourth and the final of our uh, Lenten Wednesday uh, presentations. Uh, today happens to be, of course, it's March the 25th, and it's a very important uh, feast in our church year. Uh, it's the uh, a solemnity, which is the highest ranking of liturgical feasts, and it's the Feast of the Annunciation. Uh, we remember today that biblical passage from St. Luke where the angel Gabriel uh, comes to Mary and announces, that's the Annunciation, that God has chosen her to be the mother of his son. Mary would be the, the, the gateway, the portal through whom a God would come, the Son of God come and uh, take on our flesh in the mystery of the Incarnation. I'd like to begin with a, a prayer uh, that uh, remembers that, and it's a prayer that we can include in our daily prayers actually here at the Catholic Center, at the Diocesan Center. Uh, every um, uh, noontime, everything stops and someone over the loudspeaker prays that prayer for us. And perhaps you know the prayer, perhaps you even use it at school. But um, let's uh, pray, it's called the Angelus, and it recalls the Annunciation to Mary and the great uh, mystery of God's plan of salvation where the Word of God becomes flesh. That's really the heart of, of this prayer. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So let's begin this morning by praying. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ your Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Great. Well, our topic for this uh, fourth uh, Lenten Wednesday presentation is about your future, uh, your, what happens after graduation from high school, and it was entitled, uh, Meeting the Challenge of Staying Catholic in College. And I think that's a good word that's in there, the challenge of remaining faithful to your commitment as a Catholic uh, to continue practicing and growing. It's not a matter of just maintaining the course, but, but to continue to grow in understanding, uh, in living your faith, and in practicing your faith, especially uh, in the Eucharist and the other sacraments. So uh, I'd like to address that topic, and then again, as we have let time uh, at the end, uh, toward the end, for your uh, questions or comments. That's the part that I certainly enjoy the most. I thought what we might do, uh, the way of presenting this topic, is to use a parable that our Lord told. It's one I know you're familiar with, and uh, to look at uh, the four different conditions that he uh, describes in the parable of the sower. If you want to look this parable up, it's in the 13th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. So what I'd like to do is to read the parable and then what our Lord did uh, uh, for his disciples uh, when they got alone after he told the parable, they said, hey, we didn't quite understand this. Would you explain it to us? And it's one of the few parables where Jesus takes it section by section and he elaborates uh, the different um, uh, images, the, the meaning of the, the four different soils on which uh, the seed fell. 
which was thrown out by the, by the sower. You know, in our Lord's day, they, we, we plant things. I like to plant a garden and, and you know, you just put a couple seeds and cover it over and a couple seeds. Well, the, the style there was they would put on sort of an apron and have all the seeds and just throw handfuls of the seed in every direction. That's the image that you might want to have in your mind as we hear this parable that our Lord told and it's in the 13th chapter of St. Matthew. So here's the parable, then we'll move on to the, the four different explanations that Jesus gives. On that day when he had gone out from the house, Jesus sat on the seashore, and such great crowds gathered to hear him that he went into a boat, and he sat there. And the whole crowd took their stand on the seashore, and he spoke many things in parables to them. Look, he said, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured it. But some seed fell upon stony ground, where it had not much earth. And because it had no depth of earth, it sprang up immediately. But when the sun rose, it was scorched, and it withered away because it had no root. Other seed fell upon thorns, and the thorns came up and choked the life out of it, but others fell on good ground and yielded fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. He who has ears, let him hear. That's the parable that our Lord told. And then he goes on in that same chapter, chapter 13 of St. Matthew, to describe a little bit more fully because his disciples were curious, they didn't quite get it. And so our Lord elaborated on the four different types of soils. And that's what I'd, I'd like to do. And I, I came upon a, uh, a publication that was written for, for uh, Catholic high school students going to college. And they, they used four words, and I borrowed those words. I've, the, the, my, my own explanation might be, be a little different, but I, I borrowed the four words, the four titles that they used for the four different soils. So the first one is called the doubter. The doubter. And here's our Lord's explanation. This is Matthew 13, 19. The seed sown on the path is the one who hears the words of the kingdom without understanding it. And the evil one comes and steals away what was sown in his heart. The evil one steals away what was sown in his heart. Living at home, as you are now, I presume, uh, you, you went to church with your family, with your mom and dad and brothers and sisters. Uh, your mom and dad chose a Catholic school for you, so you are in an environment where our faith is taught. Uh, you have an opportunity to question, to learn more, to grow in your understanding. Uh, you've experienced the Catholic faith alive uh, in your school. Uh, I hope that it, it, it permeates the whole atmosphere of your school, but particularly that you have mass, you have uh, confession uh, available, uh, and you have service uh, through uh, the uh, different programs. I, I'm sure all of our schools do certain service projects that you can take on, not just for the benefit of the school, but primarily to help those who have some need. So you've been in, in an environment, both at home in your parish and in your school, where our faith is very evident. It, it's part of the air that you breathe. But um, suppose, I, I suspect too, that it's very natural for you, for all of us, to have questions about our faith or even, even doubts. You know, is all this stuff that we've heard about God, is this Catholic religion really true? Uh, how does all of this fit into the real world, especially the new world that you're going to be entering into when you uh, go away to uh, college? Does it fit in to that new world at all? Or is it something that's just totally foreign uh, to it and something that uh, you're going to find that just conflicts with the culture, with the uh, new experiences that you'll be having at college? Um, it seems that you know, it's possible to have all kinds of doubts about God's Word and Scripture. You can poke holes in Scripture if, if uh, you wish to. Uh, you can also uh, realize that the church doesn't always practice what it preaches. We preach God's word, but many times behaviors fall short of that. So the, per the church is a human community as well as a divine institution. So it has flaws. Um, uh, your faith, uh, mass, holy communion, um, th these things might seem to be almost childish. 
when you move into that more sophisticated uh, world of college life on campus. So those are, those are very real possibilities. And my response is this. All of the questions that you might have about your faith, still, you haven't learned everything. I haven't learned everything there is to know about this tremendously rich legacy of our Catholic faith and the doctrines of our church. You know, it's like a very deep mine and you can keep going deeper and deeper and getting out this rich mineral, these truths, but we'll never exhaust this mine. We'll, we'll never be able to say the last word about these truths. So we can always go more deeply in our understanding and appreciation of the truths of our faith. And I would say that when we do have questions about our faith, when we do have doubts uh, about our faith, that's not the reason to throw your faith overboard just because you're questioning something or even perhaps disagree uh, with something. Uh, the, the first uh, reaction um, shouldn't be to dump our faith or dump the church. Um, a mature person, I would say, someone who is mature, um, should be motivated, should be motivated in your curiosity to go more deeply and find out what the reality is that the church does teach. Many times our doubts and our questions are based on misunderstandings of the church's teaching. And I guarantee you that the answers are there waiting to be discovered. They absolutely are. It's just a matter of letting your curiosity guide you in the right direction to find the answers to your questions and the answers to your doubts. But you'll find them only if you seek them. If you just stop at the questions, stop at your doubts, uh, and, 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 and that's it, well, then you're going to want to say, well, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't fit in, I'm going to throw it away. And that's not a mature response. You'll find the answers. They're there to be discovered if you seek, and seek in the right places. I had a quote, and I have it on my iPhone, actually, in my, 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 um, uh, where the notes section is in the iPhone. Um, I, and I came upon it that Pope Benedict said, now you probably know Pope Dan Benedict was one of the, the greatest theologians of the 20th century, into the 21st century, a brilliant intellect, a university professor, author of all kinds of very deep theological books and, and very popular uh, theological books uh, from his uh, speeches and his homilies. So a brilliant man. But here's the quote that I treasure from Pope Benedict about questions of our faith. Uh, and, and what, what he, his attitude toward that is. He, he said this, quote, I can be obedient. I, I, can, I can accept the truths that he might have still questions or not quite understand. I can be obedient because it, because it is my fundamental conviction that my intelligence is limited and the church is always wiser. I, I love that quote because the church and its teachings have, is a, a, has been distilled over 20 centuries. And I think that me and in my uh, time that I've been alive, I, I, I can uh, uh, analyze the church's teaching and find fault with them. Uh, Pope Benedict said, no, this is much bigger than me. And I'm obedient to the teachings of the church because the church is always wiser than I am. That, that's a great humble uh, admission, but it's reality. And I hope that as you struggle with questions that you might have about your faith, doubts, um, look for the answers. They're there. Uh, and in the end, even if the answer doesn't seem to satisfy, I love this quote from Pope Benedict, I can accept the truths of the church because the church is always wiser than I am. So that's the first one, the doubter. The second one th that our Lord explains in this parable of the sower, they call the grabber, the grabber. And, and here's the explanation of the second kind of soil. He said, the seed sown among the thorns is the one who hears the word, but then worldly anxiety and the lure of riches choke the word, and it bears no fruit. Now, as you move into the new world, the new experiences of, of college life, there are a lot of things that can cause you anxiety. You know, worries that really get kicked up to a, a higher level that kind of can permeate uh, a, a lot of your life. Um, that, and and he, he refers to the lure of riches. Well, in college, not many college students get rich unless you're an exceptional entrepreneur and start your own business or something on the side. But, but the lure of riches, the, the, the goal can dominate your life and you can become obsessed with your career 
what your future uh, might hold, uh, what your GPA will be, whether you're going to go to grad school. Uh, all, all of those things can begin to dominate your life, cause anxiety, and you want to just grab everything that you can get and, and feel that you can earn that, rather than lose a sense that everything is God's gift to us. Uh, your intelligence, your health, everything is God's gift. We didn't, you didn't cause that to be yourself. You didn't, um, um, you didn't earn your, uh, your health, your well-being, your, your intelligence, um, uh, none of that. It, it's God's gift to us, and that should make us grateful. But if we forget that truth, then we seem to want to think that we've earned everything we have and we want to grab more and more and more. And that's what our Lord says. When that happens, we push God to the edges. Maybe we push God over the edge. We push religion and church and faith over the edge and just totally ignore it. And, um, and, and that's, that's when we bear no fruit. It's that kind of soil. That's a, the second possibility. So there's the doubter, then the grabber. And then the third um, one is, they call the pushover. The pushover. I, I like that phrase. And, and this is Matthew 13, beginning at verse 20. Here's our Lord describing the third type of soil. The seed sown on rocky ground is the one who hears the word and receives it at once with joy. But he has no root and lasts for only a time. When some tribulation or persecution comes because of the world, he immediately falls away. He immediately falls falls away. I think it's probably this is the easiest of our Lord's interpretations of the parable to understand. If your roots in our faith, if your roots in Christ, your roots in the church are not deep enough, you have no chance of surviving. No chance of surviving college life. College will be a test of how deep your roots are sunk in our Catholic faith and always understanding that we can go more deeply. And that's part of the, the project, the challenge of when you go to college, to continue to let those roots grow and, and become even more deep, come deeper than, than they are already uh, in your high school years. Um, you'll be, of course, away from all of the support system that you have now, away from parents, away from home, away from your uh, other family members, and of course your classmates, your good friends at school and other friends that you have unless they're going to the same campus with you, and that's not probably likely. But So you're going to experience this uh, independence, this uh, isolation, and, and when that happens, problems that crop up, and they will, can always seem bigger than they are. They can seem bigger than life itself when you're in that period of transition and feeling isolated or distant from everything that was your support during your high school years. Um, and you're going to look for some refuge. Huh? You're going to be looking for some place to go to uh, feel better about that, some, some retreat, kind of. Uh, to uh, be pr in a more comfortable zone than when, when than that these uh, problems are causing you. And of course, some options are social life, partying, uh, sexual immorality. There are all kinds of options that uh, college students move toward um, because this feeling of alienation and want to be connected, want, want to be accepted or uh, begin a new life, begin a, a new phase of life uh, through uh, those that are uh, opportunities that are there for you on, on the campus. Now in, in this interpretation, our Lord mentions persecution. Persecution comes and he immediately falls away. And I think on some campuses, we have to be very, very honest, um, there is a quiet but a deep-rooted hostility towards faith. And as a matter of fact, I would say specifically, there can be a quiet and deep-rooted hostility toward Catholicism, your faith, my faith. Um, and you might find it among two groups at the college. First of all, there are some professors who will go out of their way to be hostile toward anyone who has a faith. They, they themselves have come to some conclusion that there is no God or something uh, along those lines, and they are in a position of authority over you as a student, and uh, they sometimes, unfortunately, use the, the platform of their classroom to get these ideas of theirs across, and, and there can be a hostility 
toward the faith in which you're formed and the faith in which you believe. Um, uh, some colleges uh, even allow a climate that is uh, discriminating, hostile toward Christianity in particular and, and Catholicism. So, um, and our Christian morality, you know, what we believe is right, the, the correct conduct that, that Christ asks of us can be subject to harsh criticism, um, particularly in, in the areas of the psychology uh, sociology, some of you will be studying in those fields, but it can also be true in history and literature. Professors can abuse their authority and attack our faith. So this, this persecution that Jesus talks about uh, isn't necessarily uh, done by the, by the Roman emperors, it might have been in his time, but it can happen in an academic situation uh, very easily. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it does seem very often that Christianity or Catholicism is the only re religion that can be openly disrespected, uh, it can be mocked, it can be ridiculed uh, safely uh, on, on campuses. And uh, I've, I've experienced that my, myself in, in campus ministry, and I've spent a number of years in several different colleges, and for uh, a few years, uh, nine, I was the, uh, the bishop moderator for the, the National Catholic Campus Ministry Association. So, uh, and we would discuss these, these problems, which are very real, and, and you, you may, you may be directly subject to uh, those kinds of things. Um, it's a very deal to difficult, uh, very uh, difficult to deal uh, with, with this sort of thing, because the professors are persuasive, uh, hard to argue with, of course, and they also are in control of you. You want to pass a course, you're going to be somewhat fearful of uh, disagreeing with them. But um, you need to know that any profs who would use the classroom to ridicule anyone's beliefs, not just ours, but to ridicule anyone's uh, belief, uh, are, are abusing their position. This is not why they're uh, hired by your college to teach in the classroom. Um, and I, I would just ask you, uh, to uh, pray for them if you encounter such a professor, uh, but don't allow yourself to be bullied by them when it comes to your faith. Um, don't be a pushover when you hear someone criticizing any people of faith. Now, that's the first source. It can be the professors. But secondly, your peers, your fellow students, can also, uh, in a sense, be persecutors. Um, there's a huge subculture uh, among students who have thrown off their faith, whatever faith, if they were raised in a faith at all. And um, uh, you'll, you'll have to deal with that. You'll have to learn to be mature and strong uh, among your own peers uh, to maintain your Catholic faith. Um, some uh, college students think that you know, they were sent there, that, it, that it's all about partying, it's all about alcohol, it's all about drugs, sexual indulgence, uh, hooking up. Uh, those, those sorts of things. Now, I didn't just fall off a tree, so I know that these are things you've had to navigate already. You've had to navigate them in, in high school, um, and, and so, but there's going to be a difference here, and that is that you don't, again, have the support system of family uh, and, and good friends and, and your, your, your parish, so you're going to be independent from that, and it might make it much more difficult uh, in that permissive atmosphere for you to continue to take charge of, of your life and, and your faith. Um, so, so that's the, the, third, the third person, uh, the, the, the pushover, who, who once there's some hostility directed toward him or her, uh, just gives up and, and throws, off, throws off our, uh, our faith. Um, there's an old saying, if, if, you don't st if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. Huh? If you stand for nothing, you stand for something, you've been formed in our faith, stand firm uh, in that faith and don't fall for anything else. But the pushover will. And finally, there's the good soil. And, and that topic, the title for that is the strong one. The strong one. This is Matthew 13, 23. This is the fourth type of soil that Jesus describes. But the seed sown on the rich soil is the one who hears the word and understands it, and indeed bears fruit, and yields a hundred or sixty or thirty fold. There's the good soil. Um, th this, this is the, the fourth and really uh, the, the only option for us if you're going to survive 
uh, in your Catholic faith. Uh, let your faith, let the faith that God has planted in you through your parents, your teachers, your experience in Catholic school, let that faith that the school has nourished continue to blossom, continue to bear fruit. Um, unlike the doubter, the first uh, interpretation, the first type of soil, you're willing to explore our Catholic faith and find, look for the answers to the questions and the doubts that you might have. Unlike the grabber, you want to keep your priorities right and keep God and gratitude to God for all of his gifts first uh, in your life. And unlike the pushover, you want to be stronger. You want to be stronger in your faith. You've learned to rely on God, to trust God in every situation, and especially when you experience opposition or some kind of difficulties and you refuse to be dominated by popular opinion. Uh, that's that's the, uh, the good soil. Uh, that's the, the, uh, the, 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 what is possible for us uh, to maintain our faith by God's grace. So you won't betray who you are. You won't betray yourself by needing to fit in and therefore giving up whatever other people criticize about you. Uh, of course you're happy to be liked. Everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to fit in but you're not unwilling to be disliked if there are those who demand that you change who you are in order to be acceptable to them. You're happy to be accepted, but you're not afraid to be misunderstood, as people may do when we are people of faith. So, um, th th those are uh, the, um, the four types of soil in, in, in that parable, and I think that they apply really well to four options or four conditions that could describe you as you go on to uh, life on, on campus. Um, you were baptized, and you were confirmed, uh, sealed with God the Holy Spirit. You have all the gifts that you need to survive, to continue to grow in your faith, uh, and to be a witness on campus, you're being sent by this. I, I think you, you, you should understand that however this process and whatever college uh, that you're going to be going to uh, is in God's plan for you. Right? He's working it out through the decisions you and others are making, but, but he's sending you to a particular campus to be his witness, right? to, to be there as an authentic disciple, to draw others to Christ, to learn from others, of course, but also to be a, a clear uh, uh, believer who brings Christ's presence in a new way to that campus that no one else has been able to do because of your uniqueness and to be a witness to Christ among your peers and everyone at that college. That, that's part of God's plan for you and, and I, I hope that you'll, you'll cooperate with that and uh, continue to be strong uh, in, in your faith. Um, Freedom, of course, is one of the biggest issues that we all have to deal with, and you will have a new found freedom when you go away to college. And uh, depending on how you've developed your character um, will, will depend on how you use that newfound freedom that is yours. Um, many think that I'm not free unless I say yes, I can, I'm able to say yes to anything, and that means I'm totally free. I have the freedom to say yes. Well, um, is that really the uh, hallmark of human freedom, to be able to say yes just when you want to? So no, you can't say no to anything because that would restrict you, that would limit you. So freedom means you have the, the option of saying yes to everything that, that you want. Um, you can't be a slave to yes, and many people are. That's a very false sense of what our human freedom is. Freedom consists in not doing what we want to do or in doing what everybody else is doing. That's not freedom. Freedom uh, to safeguard the right to do what we ought to do. See, there's a level of obligation that we have because of who we are and the gifts that you've been given. And so to be truly free is to do what I ought to do in God's eyes. That's what I'm using the fullness of my human capacity as a free person. So I'd like to say a couple things in conclusion and leave more time than for your observations or your questions um, regarding uh, positive steps um, 
that I, I'd like to recommend to you as you uh, settle into uh, college life and that whole new world. And, and really it's five C's that I, I put together here, five C's. First of all, community. Community. You're leaving your primary community, a family, your school community, your church community, and you've got to find a new community. You've, you, it, as I mentioned earlier, all of us want to be accepted. All of us want connections. We are relational, and, and we need to be in good relations with others. It's part of who we are. And I'm recommending that, that uh, as at least part of, if not the primary community, that you look for when you get to campus is the community that you'll find at a Newman Center or a Catholic Campus Ministry Center. Some colleges have a group called FOCUS. You may be familiar with them. It's called the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. FOCUS, a wonderful group. I was able to bring them to the University of Kentucky. They're in their seventh year now there, and they, they are tremendously uh, faithful Catholics. They themselves are recent college graduates and they give at least two years of their life, minimally two years, to work on campus with college students. And uh, just wonderful, wonderful uh, young people and very devoted to the church and very devoted to keeping their uh, fellow, keeping the, the students on campus Catholic uh, and, and offer many opportunities, especially built around Bible studies and wonderful communities of friends form around these Bible study groups. But you'll find that at the Newman Center. Newman Centers are our Catholic church on campus, named after a great convert, an English convert to the church, Cardinal John Henry Newman. And in his honor, these Newman Centers were named because he, he wrote a, a, a wonderful work on the idea of a university and what the real uh, purpose of higher education is. And uh, in his honor, they, we name our, these Catholic centers on campuses Newman Center. So, so find the Newman Center, find, <clears throat> find the Catholic campus uh, ministry uh, on your campus and let that be a source of community, a foundation for community and relationships uh, on, on campus. Now, not every campus has a, a, a Newman Center or a Catholic campus ministry center. So if that's not available to you, look for a close by Catholic church. Um, many times a priest from a local church might just come on campus to have mass or, or there will be programs at a nearby um, uh, Catholic church for college students. Um, I had a great example of that in a place called Danville, not Pennsylvania, but Danville, Kentucky, where there's a beautiful college called Center College. And uh, they didn't have presence on the campus, but it was really within a short walking distance to our St. Peter and Paul Church in Danville. And they had a lot of programs. The parishioners were very supportive of the college students and the priest, and, and they had lots of programs. there. So you may find that if there's not a Newman Center or a Catholic Campus Ministry Center on your campus, look for a close-by Catholic church that particularly welcomes college students and engages you in the life of the parish. So that's the first C, community. You've got to find a good, strong community in which to find support for yourself away from home, away from school and church. The second is catechesis, and that's going back to that doubter. Your education in Catholicism, your growth in understanding the faith doesn't end with graduation. It can't. We all need to be lifelong learners of our faith. And, and so I invite you to be engaged somehow and through Bible study, through discussion groups uh, regarding the teachings of our church, uh, to continue your own personal catechesis. Right? Uh, we're all disciples, and the very meaning of disciple, in the root meaning of that word, is a learner. Right? So we're apostles, we're sent, but you also at the same time have to balance that being a witness to Christ by continuing to learn Christ, to continuing to encounter him in his truth through the process of catechesis. And, and so uh, you need to do something about continuing to grow in your understanding of our faith. That's the second C, community, catechesis. The third I'm calling just communion. And there I mean don't grow distant from the mass. That's the easiest thing to throw off. You've been up late studying or something else on a Saturday night and um, uh, you just don't feel like getting up. You can sleep. Now you don't have the discipline of parents waking you up and saying, get up, we're going to church. Uh, this is all on your own freedom. It's on your own discipline. 
but don't lose that communion with the church. Continue to, to uh, find a mass of a, a, a bit, many places might have a Sunday evening mass, Saturday evening mass if it's possible for you to get to those if Sunday morning is too difficult. But remember Eucharist, remember the sacrament of confession that's always available to encounter Christ in his mercy through the sacrament of reconciliation. So I'm, I'm calling that the third C, to continue practicing your faith through the church's liturgy and sacraments, communion. So community, catechesis, communion. The fourth is Christian service. Christian service. We all need to be involved in using our energy, our hands, our feet, our hearts in serving the needs of others. And uh, I invite you, and if you do get connected to a Newman Center or a campus ministry or a nearby parish, there probably will be opportunities for you to engage in Christian service, to help people in a variety of ways. I, I know a lot of college students like on their spring break, instead of going out somewhere into the Caribbean, um, that they'll go to some, uh, the, the, uh, the campus will organize some kind of a service uh, somewhere here in the, in the States to go help um, repair homes, uh, do all sorts of possi possible uh, wonderful service projects. So uh, look for that, that opportunity. There's a wonderful story about a great 20th century theologian, a Jesuit priest. Uh, his name was Karl Rahner. You might have heard of him in your religion classes. He was a, a university professor for uh, much of his life, as well as a tremendous author. But he said that when he taught at the university, students would come to him and say to him, um, Father, I think I'm losing my faith. Can you recommend a book for me to read? Uh, can, you, can you point out some book that would help me because I'm losing my faith. And Father Karl Rahner would say to that student, he said, he said, I would never recommend a book. I would tell the student, go into Munich, serve the poor, and you'll rediscover your faith. So get engaged somehow, and I know time, time is, is very limited and, and you've got many demands on your time, for study and other things, a, a, a campus life. But at the same time, try to balance that with making some time for Christian service in your personal schedule. It'll make a big difference in finding Christ in those you're serving. Because it's all about encountering Christ. It's not about up here, it's really about here. And, and, and Mother Teresa is the one who, who certainly showed us that we, we see Christ and we, we can love Christ when we are addressing and serving the poor and whatever needs they may have. So that's the fourth C, Christian service. And finally, after community, catechesis, communion, Christian service, I'm gonna add the fifth one, come back. Because if you happen to lapse, if you happen to walk away from the practice of your faith, then at any moment, remember the fifth C, come back. The church always wants to welcome you. So many. Uh, stories in the New Testament, our Lord told parables about how he went searching for what was lost. God comes after us uh, when we have walked away from him. The parable of the prodigal son is a beautiful example. The father runs to get to meet the son when he starts, he turns around. But we have to turn around. So I just want you to know that should you at some point drift away from the church, um, you, it, the opportunity to come back to your faith is always there. The door is always open without condemnation, without judgment. The church, Christ in his church, welcomes you back to begin again. We can always start over and, and rediscover the beauties of uh, our Catholic faith. So those are the, the five C's that I'd have you think about to keep your faith uh, as you head off to college. Right? Find your community um, uh, in, in the, um, it, somehow in the presence of the church that's on your campus. Uh, remember to continue your own catechetical understanding of the faith, your catechesis. Your communion with the liturgy and sacraments of the church, don't lose that union with Christ in the most direct way he offers himself to us in the liturgy and the sacraments. Christian service to discover Christ in those who have particular needs. And finally, if you should drift, come back. The church wants you to be with us. Christ wants you to be in your family of faith, the Catholic Church. So those are the things I'd like to, I wanted to share with you this morning in this uh, fourth and final Lenten talk. Um, we have some time, 15 minutes or so. 
Would uh, anyone like to ask a question or make a comment? I'd be happy to hear. I'm Kurt. Is this getting it? Hello? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Good morning. Hi, I'm Carson Nicholas. Hey, uh, Carson. Good morning, Bishop. Good I'm morning. from Trinity High School. Uh, my question is, what if while we're at college or while I'm at college, I discover a different faith, be it a different denomination or religion altogether, than the one I find, or uh, than the one I was raised in? And what if I find it to be a better personal fit? Um, should I try to hold steadfastly in my original faith, or should I be open to change in that way? And can I find God in different ways? Well, I would, I would refer to one, one of the things I said. If, if you, uh, suppose you, uh, your roommate, let's say, is uh, Buddhist or, or uh, Methodist. I mean, the, the big differences. But, uh, and, and all of a sudden, there, there's something about that person's faith that attracts you. Um, I think you want to you kind of analyze that. What is it? And then doesn't our, what is it about our faith? Can, can you find that? Uh, aspect in our Catholic Church, in our Catholic faith. Uh, I would certainly not uh, encourage, recommend uh, that you would abandon ship and, and move immediately over to that other faith, whatever, that other religion or belief, whatever it is, but rather to, as I mentioned, seek the answer um, in the right places uh, within our church, within our, within our faith. Um, I, I believe that you would, you would find, after an honest search, that what, what might be attracting you to that other faith can be found uh, in, our, in our Catholic faith. Remember, if we go back to the, the very first session we had, we, we believe that what Jesus intended, now, you know, this all depends. First of all, do you believe that Jesus is the only Savior of humanity, and that he, he is the only bridge between humanity and divinity? Uh, he, he is the fullness of what God intended uh, uh, for our salvation. Now, if, if you believe that, then anything that departs from Christ is less. No matter how attractive or magnetic uh, it might seem to you, uh, if, it, if it is not in Christ, then it isn't the fullness of what God intends for us. So it's going to be a diminishing of the truth and the diminishing of the means of sanctification. Remember, we said that all world religions have some elements of truth and sanctification. But what God wants us to have by way of knowing him and being saved, being made holy or sanctified, it subsists, it exists fully in our Catholic Church. So to move away from that is to accept something less. And why would you want to do that for yourself? So my answer would be for you to continue to search for what that aspect is that's attracting you in the other religion to find how it's present in our Catholic faith. Does that? Uh, do you, please. Thank you, Bishop. Um, but I have a follow-up question. Does that mean that other denominations other than Catholicism are lesser? Well, I, I, it, um, I think what we have to say is that the fullness of what God intends, which exists in the Catholic Church, does not exist in its fullness in other denominations. I, that, that's what we, what we believe. For instance, um, we believe that, that the means of sanctification that we have in the church, that there are seven sacraments, seven events, seven saving events in which we encounter the real risen Jesus Christ in person. He encounters us in those seven most sacred ways in the church, beginning with baptism and the initiation sacraments and, and the other four sacraments. Now, in a church that doesn't have those seven sacraments, there are less. There, there is, there's uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper or communion, right? uh, pretty much in, in the other, other church. Now, the Lutheran Church admits of a sacrament of confession. Uh, the Episcopal Church has it in, in quite, not quite the same way, but, but nevertheless, uh, it, it is less in as much as we have what we believe is the fullness of what God wanted to give to humanity. This is, this is God's gift to us. It's not because we created it, but 
God in revealing himself to us and in working out our salvation uh, gave us this fullness. And, and it continues to exist in its fullness in the Catholic Church. So it, it's not a judgment or a condemnation of other faiths, but it is, it, we would have to say that those elements of sanctification are fewer, are lessened as you move out that concentric circle, remember? Um, so th th I, I think that's, the, uh, th in all fairness, that's the way I would respond to your question. Uh, thank you, Bishop. That's all I have. Okay, good. Somebody from Lancaster Catholic. Lancaster Catholic? No? Did Lancaster have a... The question was the same, Bishop. Oh, okay. The question from Lancaster Catholic was the same question. Okay. Now, I, w I would say, let me add to that, while well, so maybe someone else could think of a, a, another question or a comment is welcome. Um, you know, some of the other churches, uh, we certainly have learned from some of the other Christian denominations. I, uh, I don't, don't want to sound judgmental or saying, well, we're here and they're there. But, uh, you know, the respect among what are called the Protestant churches, the other Christian denominations, the respect for God's word is something that we, we've, we've learned from them. To, to have a, a greater centrality to the word of God um, uh, in our Catholic Church. And since the Second Vatican Council, we've had a wonderful revival of the importance of uh, God's Word in Scripture. So um, I just wanted to mention that. On the same hand, many Protestant denominations have a greater appreciation for liturgy, uh, for the celebration of uh, God's, uh, to worship God and give Him praise and thanksgiving and glory through their services. And, and that's been a contribution we've made to to the uh, Protestant uh, churches. So, so uh, the different denominations sometimes have a different uh, contribution that they make to the whole uh, body of Christ. So I, I wanted to recognize that, but, but it, it is still true that if the Catholic Church is what Jesus intended his church to be in its fullness, then we can't be bashful about saying that. Is someone, is someone up there? Lebanon Catholic, how are you? Good morning. Hey, how are you, Bishop? How I'm are doing you? all right. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, good. My name's Troy Buckley. Hey, Troy. I'm actually a convert. <laughs> how you doing? I'm actually a converting Catholic right now. I uh, just converted from the uh, evangelical faith. And uh -huh. I was wondering, uh, my question pertains to the uh, Byzantine Church and uh -huh. our relationship with them. Uh-huh. Sure. Well, um, First of all, welcome. It's wonderful to welcome you into full communion with our Catholic oh, Church. Oh, it's great. I love it. Thank oh, great. you. Good for you. Uh, we've just had four uh, uh, Sundays at our cathedral, Vespers, where I've had a chance to welcome those who are in that process, like yourself, or uh, uh, to yeah, come you, into full communion. Actually, uh, we actually met before. Oh, you um, were there? Actually, twi twice before, yeah. Wonderful. I, I have a picture with you and everything. <laughs> great, great, Troy. Well, it's, it's wonderful to welcome you. Thanks, thanks for uh, that comment. Yeah, the Byzantine Church, well, it's called the Byzantine Churches. Uh, uh, many people don't recognize or realize this, but our Catholic Church exists in 22 churches. And we think, well, the Catholic Church is one church. Well, the truth is that there are 22 churches uh, that are held together in one Catholic unity by the Supreme Shepherd, by the, by the Pope. Um, that word pontiff that we sometimes use, the Supreme Pontiff, comes from a Latin word, two Latin words, a bridge builder, pons, pontis, and facere. So, so that word pontiff means a bridge builder. It really came originally from the Roman religion. The, the Pontifex Maximus was the, 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 the great high priest of the Roman religion, and he built a bridge between humanity and divinity. Well. Christianity took that term over, the Catholic, the Catholic Church took that term to refer solely to the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, who builds a bridge between humanity and divinity. He's the vicar of Christ who 
perfectly brings together humanity and divinity in his own person. But the Pope also builds this bridge between humanity and divinity because of Christ, but he also is the bridge among those 22 churches. Um, and they developed because of the early evangelization of the peoples uh, coming out of different places. Rome sent missionaries to places like England and Germany and France, but Constantinople sent missionaries pretty much into Eastern Europe. Europe. And from there, using the people's language and practices and their traditions, uh, their uh, various disciplines and gestures and things, the different churches developed. And, and so uh, in our own area here, when we speak of Byzantine, we have the Ruthenian Catholic Church, we have the Ukrainian Catholic Church. There are churches in the Middle East, um, uh, for instance, the Coptic Church, we've heard in the news where 21 of those uh, Christian men were beheaded. Uh, that's, a, that's another one of the 21 Eastern churches. So the Latin church, which most of us, most of you who are listening, belong to the Latin Catholic Church, that represents 97% of the Catholic world. But the other 3% is divided up into those 21 Eastern churches. Now sometimes they're, they're referred to just in a general way as Byzantine. So they are one, we are all one in the Catholic Church, uh, united through the uh, chief shepherd of the church, um, all in the sacraments, in the creed, we have the one creed. It's just that they use different practices, especially liturgically, that represent the origins where those churches originally grew up. Um, they, they use various practices uh, and the vestments and uh, rituals are different because they, they grew up in a different culture, a different part of the world from Rome. Whereas those of us in the Latin church are um, uh, practices, things like a genuflection, uh, bending your knee, the, uh, the, the vestments that the priest wears, the deacon wears, th th those are, are pretty much representative of the Roman culture where, where St. Peter and St. Paul went and, and where the center of, uh, and, and really the center of the whole Catholic world still is because the Pope is the Bishop of Rome and he's the chief shepherd of all those 22 churches. So do I, does that make sense? That, that's the, uh, yes. When we talk about the Byzantine Catholic Church, it, it refers to a, a, a portion of those 21 Eastern churches. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Bishop. And I was just wondering, the reason uh, why they have 21 different churches, is it because they don't have a vicar themselves? or No, that, there is someone yeah. uh, who is in charge of, uh, who oversees those 21 churches. Um, but that person is also under the authority in union with the Pope. Right? Now, if you're not, if, if it was, so there, there are parallels to those Catholic Eastern, Eastern Catholic churches that are called Orthodox churches. And the real difference with them is that they have lost union with the Bishop of Rome. So they've separated themselves and they're called Orthodox churches, so you would have a Ukrainian Orthodox church, a Greek Orthodox church, a Syrian Orthodox church. Um, they have lost communion, lost union with the Bishop of Rome and with the Universal Catholic Church. So, um, uh, but it all depends on, on maintaining that unity with the Bishop of Rome. Well, that did it. Thank you, uh, Bishop. Mm -hmm. Wait, what? Oh, I, I started to say about their heads. Yeah, th there are different patriarchs in the church, and uh, they are, uh, again, under the oversight of the Pope, but they are the heads of those different churches. S some have patriarchs, some have what are called major archbishops. Uh, there, there are different uh, levels of authority or structure in those churches, but nevertheless, they do have someone who oversees the church, but that person is also in union with the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. Thank you, Bishop. You're very welcome. Do you have a question? Hi, Bishop, I'm back. Hey, good. Good back, um, welcome. I have, um, 
Uh, I have two follow-up questions. The first one is, uh, so the Catholic view is that Catholicism is the fullest expression of Christianity, correct? It is the fullest, yeah, it, it, the fullest expression in history of what Jesus intended for his church. All right, now does that view make it harder to be ecumenical with other denominations? No, no I, I would say not. Uh, first of all, we, we respect all those elements. Remember, my, the basic premise is that um, we respect the other churches, that's, uh, and we respect the other religions for the elements of truth and sanctification that, that are there. And especially when we're talking about other Christian denominations, uh, we are one with them in baptism, which is the litmus test for Christianity. Do you believe in a trinity, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and one God? And then secondly, baptism, which brings us into the life of, that, of God. Um, so we share, the, that's the most fundamental thing. So it, it doesn't make ecumenism uh, more difficult. In fact, given that platform of the unity we have, what the Catholic Church wants to do, and I, and I think other denominations as well, we, we want to continue to build that and examine the things that we say divide us so that we might be able to come to a, a harmonious understanding and then eliminate those things that are divisions. We, we've seen in the last 50 years since the Second Vatican Council uh, a great movement toward reuniting. And there have been issues uh, for instance, with the uh, Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church, the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church, where certain issues that were seen to be insurmountable, these are just really big, wide divisions, but through scholarship and prayer and working on those things, we're able to talk about them in ways that are so similar that we can say, well, it's not the same major division that we originally thought that it was. So we've reached what's called theological concord, like a harmony in our theological understanding of, 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 of some issues that are major issues of division. So what, we, what we've seen over, certainly over the last 50 years is a, is a, is a gradual development of a, of a greater unity and mutual respect and understanding. But we wouldn't be fair. We, we can't have ecumenism if you don't represent the truth that you know and the truth that's been handed to you. If you pretend, well, everybody's the same, well, that's not gonna get anywhere. You've gotta know what are the divisions, what, what are the different teachings, and, and how do we, can we talk about them in a way that we can begin to bring our understanding closer together between Catholic and Lutheran, Catholic and Anglican, Catholic and Baptist. There, all these dialogues have been going on and they're absolutely, absolutely wonderful. They're moving us a little uh, closer and closer because uh, didn't at the Last Supper, our Lord kind of foresaw that there would be divisions, and what He wants for us is a unity. And He said that they all may be one, as you, Father, and I are one. May they be one in us, or we as are one in, in each other. So the desire is Christian unity, and in fact, the divisions of Christianity has been called the scandal of Christianity because uh, we can't agree with one another. How can we attract non-Christians? Right? Someone says, well, this is what Jesus meant. This is what Jesus meant. This is what he intended. That's what he intended. It's confusing to the world. So the, the more harmony and unity we have among Christians, the more convincing we become to the world to draw people to Christ. The divisions are an obstacle, no question about it. Go ahead. What, you, had, you had another question you said. Uh, I have one or two more. Um, so does that mean perfect ecumenism would be all of the other denominations returning as closely as they can to the Catholic Church? Uh, you know, that, that, that's a very good question. You're really thinking now like a, a theologian. Uh, what, what would it mean to have this fullness of unity? And I think we've seen some examples of it. We wouldn't be asking it, it, to return to communion with the Catholic Church, maybe without abandoning those strengths and some of the aspects that that are good qualities of those other churches. Uh, for instance, we, we now have a bunch of uh, uh, communities that are, uh, were Episcopalian, right? and they have come into full union with the Catholic Church. But what the church has done is said, you know what, you can continue to use a form of your Book of Common Prayer and celebrate the Mass according to the Anglican usage uh, with a few changes, and so that those customs and traditions 
and the form of worship that was part of those, those congregations uh, remains intact. But they make their profession of faith in, in the Catholic uh, Church and in the doctrines, uh, the, the profession of faith of the Catholics, and, and then some adjustments to make sure that their sacraments will be valid. Um, and they don't lose all of the distinguishing characteristics that were theirs before. So there, there's a way of accommodating that. So we're not saying, look, if you want to have real unity, abandon everything and come fully into the Catholic Church. We can have that full communion, but maintaining some of those characteristics that were part of the traditions of those other churches. That's happened in a number of ways. Armenians and other groups have come into communion that were separated, and they don't have to just take lock, stock, and barrel, do everything the way we do it. We still honor their, their forms of worship, their traditions and disciplines, but they come into full communion with the Catholic Church. One very last one, Bishop. Um, does, could the Catholic Church begin to be more ecumenical by opening up the physical communion to other denominations, say allowing Protestants to partake in it, or are the um, or are the reasons that they cannot partake in it too great to allow them to partake in it to open up ecumenism? Well, that's that's an excellent question, uh, and I'm 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 very grateful that you asked it. Uh, at this point here, let me explain our discipline. Uh, could it change? Pope Francis, I suspect, could could uh, make a change. Uh, but right now, here, here's the position uh, as, as we articulate it. The fullest, the supreme expression of our unity with Christ and one another is to receive the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist. Right? That there is no fuller expression, not just a symbol of our unity, but the reality of our oneness in Christ in the one church is expressed when I say amen to the body of Christ. And uh, there's an old expression from the fathers of the church, the church makes the Eucharist and the Eucharist makes the church. So when I say my amen to the body of Christ, I'm saying it to the Eucharistic body of Christ present before me in the consecrated host. I'm also saying amen to the mystical body of Christ. The church makes the Eucharist, the Eucharist makes the church. You can't separate them. So when I am in full communion with the Catholic Church, I can say amen, yes, this is Jesus, present, the real presence in this consecrated host, and this is Jesus in his mystical body, the church. That amen has two directions. The host, I'm saying amen, I believe this is the true body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. I also believe that Jesus is present in his mystical body, which celebrates the Eucharist. So it's a double amen. And unless you can say amen to the mystical body, unless you're in full communion with the mystical body, then it's not an honest action to say amen to the Eucharistic body. They're, they're not, I think people would like to separate them and say, well, I believe that's Jesus, so I should be able to take communion. Well, if you believe that's Jesus, then you should believe that the community that makes that sacrament possible is Jesus' body, which is the Catholic Church. And so until you're in full communion with the Catholic Church, you can't honestly say amen to the Eucharist. They're not separable. Make sense? I mean, that's our position. That's, uh, that's, I, mean, uh, uh, I guess so. Thank you, Bishop. Okay. okay. Have a nice day. Yeah, you too. You too, and your questions are great. Is it time? Is it, uh, it's about 10 after uh, 10. So uh, first of all, let, uh, we're, um, uh, running, we're out of time now. This is our, our final session. I, I want you to know that I, I've certainly enjoyed the opportunity to be with you. Um, I look forward to the next uh, opportunity, but uh, I wish you well. We're certainly um, uh, toward the end of Lent now. Uh, next week is Holy Week, and we come up to those three special days, the, the high point of our church year. We were just talking about the sacraments and uh, Christ's body, the church, and the church enters into this very sacred time of the Triduum to remember the, the very saving actions of Jesus in the Last Supper, his death on Calvary, and then his resurrection. So I, I wish you every blessing as we come through these days of uh, the Paschal Triduum and then move into the wonderful Easter season. Um, this is the highlight of the church year. It's the very center and the source and the summit of our life in Christ. So I... Oh, 
Uh, yes, McDevitt, hi. Hi, um, we just wanted to say thank you for spending the past four um, Wednesdays with us out of your busy schedule and just getting the chance to talk to us and answer our questions. Well, you're very welcome. I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, let's, let's just conclude with a, a blessing. Lebanon. Oh, oh Lebanon, uh, Lebanon Catholic. Where's Lebanon? Oh. Thank you, McDe like thank you, McDevitt. Oh. Lebanon Catholic would also like to thank you for speaking to us. And we look forward to seeing you at graduation. Very good. <laughs> Well, I, I, it'll be a very happy day, and I'm, I look forward to being with you for that, too. Great. All right, well, let, me, let me just give a, we'll say a glory be to the, the Father and uh, give a blessing. And once again, it's been a joy to have the opportunity to spend these uh, four Wednesdays with you at your school. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you again.